Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 179. Please turn to it. Page number 179. The very first problem that you see on the page, problem number 189 is what we are about to do. The problem is already on the blackboard. Here is what we are told. We are told that apparently we have a swim club here uh, and the people have to just taken a test to, uh, to see if they have passed the life saving uh, course that they were taking, whatever it was. 30% of the people passed that given test. 70% of course would imply, if 30% passed it would imply that 70% did not pass the test. Of the people who did not pass the test, we are told that 12 of them had taken the course, 30 of them had taken no, no preparatory course. The question simply is, how many there are in total? Let's find out, shall we? Well, 12 had taken the course, or 12 had taken the course and 30 had not taken the course, That's, that makes a grand total of 42, and that 42 must represent 70%. 70% equals 42. Well, if 70% represents, if 70% represents 42, if you divide both sides by 7, 70 divided by 7 is going to be 10%, and 10% is going to be 7, 6, or 42. So 10% is 6. If 10% is 6, 10% is 6, which means if you were to multiply both sides by 10 one more time, well, I don't mean one more time, I mean if you were to multiply the both sides by 10 at this point in time, is what I meant to say, then 10 times 10% 10 is 100%, and 100%, as you can clearly see, equals 60. And that's what it is. There's not much in there. Next one, number one, 190. Number 190. Problem number 190. In 190, we are told that the nth term in a series we are told that we have a series of numbers and if you want to find the nth term in the series nth term is to be found by using this formula n plus 2 raised to n minus 1 for example the very first term in the series the very first term is simply going to be 1 plus 2 raised to n which is 1 so is 1 minus 1 which is simply 1 plus 2 raised to 0, and, as, and we know that any number raised to 0 is just 1, so we end up with 1 plus 1, which is 2. I'm going to actually redo this thing, I don't like the way it looks actually. Just, just give me one brief second, we'll redo it. So n1 equals, and here's the formula, n plus 2 raised to n minus 1. n plus 2 raised to n minus 1. So 1 plus 2 raised to 1 minus 1, which is 1 plus 2 raised to 0, which is 1 plus 1, which is 2. Similarly, the second term, the second term will simply be, whatever we see n in this expression, we just replace that n with 2 because we are looking at the second term. Second term will simply be 2, because n is equal to 2 now, plus 2 raised to n minus 1, so it's going to be 2 minus 1. So we end up with 2 plus 2 minus 1 is 1, so it's 2 raised to 1. 2 raised to 1 is just 2, so it's just 2 plus 2. We end up with 2 plus 2, which is 4. Similarly, n raised to the third power in the series is going to be 3 plus, because n is 3, plus 2 raised to 3 minus 1. 2 raised to 3 minus 1. And we end up with 3 plus 2 raised to 3 minus 1, 3 minus 1 is 2, so we end up with 2 raised to 2, which is 3 plus 4, which is 7. And we can go on like this forever, for example, the fifth term in the series, the fifth term is going to be, 
wherever we see n, we replace it with 5. This is our nth term. This is the nth term. So the fifth term is going to be 5 plus 2 raised to 5 minus 1. 2 raised to 5 minus 1. So that gives us our 5 plus 2 raised to 4. Because 5 minus 1, of course, is 4. 2 raised to 4 is simply, we know 2 cubed is 8, and if you multiply 8 by 2, we get 16. So it's 5 plus 16, we end up at 21. The next term, the sixth term, is going to be 6 plus 2 raised to 6 minus 1. We end up at 6 plus 2 raised to 5. 2 raised to 5, which is simply 6 plus 32. If 2 raised to 4 was 16, if 2 raised to 4 was 16, then 2 raised to 5 would be twice as much. And we end up with 32 plus 6, which is 38. And what the question is simply asking in this problem, the question was simply asking is simply the difference between the sixth term and the fifth term. The difference between the sixth term and the fifth term, we just found it, this is the sixth term, 38, minus the 21. That's all it is. We end up with 7 and 1, that's it, 17 is our answer. The answer is 17, whatever that letter happens to be. 17 is letter E. Let's do the next one, number 191. Number 100. And 91. Just give me one brief second as always. 191. In 191. If n, if x minus 1 squared, we are told equals 400, then the question is, then the question is, which of the following could be the value of x minus 5? That's all it is. Which of the following values that they give you, the 5 value that they, that they give us, could be the value of x minus 1? Notice the, notice the language could be, not must be. Of course could be because there are two possible values of x minus 5. There are going to be, there are two potential possible values, not potential, there are going to be two possible values, there are going to be two values of this quantity x minus 5 because it's a quadratic equation and therefore we're going to have two roots, a positive root and a negative root. And depending on which value of x we use there, we're going to have two different values of x minus 5 and both of them are legitimate values and hence they do not say which of the following must be, because we can use the word must be, which of the following could be. Let's see what we can do. So we are told that x minus 1 whole squared equals 40. Well, if we take a square root of both sides, if we take a square root of both sides, then we find that x minus 1 must equal positive or negative 20. x minus 1 must equal positive or negative 20. Because positive 20, because positive 20 or negative 20 when we square it, we get our 400 back. We get our 400 back. I know I'm explaining too much. So let's look at the two possibilities. So we can have x minus 1 equals to positive 20, or we can have x minus 1 equals to negative 20. They are both possible. In this scenario, this implies that in this case, x would have to be 21. We are interested in the value of x minus 5, in which case x minus 5 would be 21 minus 5, which is 16. This is one possible value. This is one possible value of x minus 5. And the possible value, and the possible value would be, in this case, x would imply, if you bring the 1 to the other side, we'll end up with negative 19. And that in turn implies that x minus 5 would be negative 19 and minus 5. So in this scenario, x minus 5 works out to be negative 24. And this is another possible value. If you look at the answer choices, if you look at the five answer choices, you, you will find that you will not have both of these values in the answer choices. Obviously, you cannot have two right answers. So if 16 is one of the answer choices, the negative 24 will not appear, and vice versa. Let's look at the answer choices. 191. 191, they do not give us 16. They start out with 15. 16 does not exist, which means the answer choice that they have is negative 24, which is letter C. Of course, they're going to use the negative root. 
because that's the whole point. They want to see if you can realize that it has this, this equation is going to have two roots, positive 20 and a negative 20. x minus 1 equals either positive 20 or negative 20. And that was the whole point. They're not going to give you a positive root. Let's go to the next one, number 192. Number 192. In number 192, they tell us that all values of x for which 1 minus x squared is greater than or equal to 0. And our job is to find all possible values where this may be true. Let's see what we can do. Okay, shall we? The well, very first thing we're going to do is we have a positive 1 here. Let's get rid of this positive 1 by subtracting 1 from both sides. So that 1 drops out and we end up with negative x squared is greater than or equal to negative 1. Let's take the quantity negative x squared greater than or equal to negative 1 and multiply both sides of the inequality by a negative 1. Now, as soon as we multiply by a negative 1, it's very important, pay attention here. As, if, as, soon as, we, as soon as we either multiply as soon as we either multiply or divide an inequality by a negative number, then the direction of the inequality must be switched. Then the direction of the inequality must be switched. It says, it says greater than or equal to, we must now, we must now switch it. It is no longer greater than or equal to, it, is, it should say now less than or equal to. It's, the direction has to switch. The direction has to switch. Do I need to write it down? Do I need to write it all out? I'm going to say it one more time. As, as, as soon as we multiply or divide both sides, of the both sides of an inequality by a negative number, the direction of the inequality has to be switched. One more time, I'm going to say it. I'm not going to write it. As soon as we multiply or divide both sides of an inequality by a negative number, for example, for example, would you agree, would you agree that 3 is less than 4? Of course you would agree. Why wouldn't you? You're not insane. But if you were to multiply both sides of this inequality by a negative number, if you multiply both sides of this inequality by a negative 1, then we end up with a negative 3 and a negative 4. And negative 3 is no longer smaller than negative 4. Negative 3 is more than negative 4. So the direction of the inequality has to be switched as soon as we multiply or divide both sides of an inequality by a negative number. Which is what we did here. We're multiplying both sides by negative 1. And the reason why we're dividing, multiplying both sides of the inequality by negative 1 is because here we have negative x squared. We are interested in x squared, not negative x squared. So we did that. And as, as a result, now we no longer have greater than or equal to. It is less than or equal to. So negative, negative times negative is positive, which was the whole point. So x squared now is less than or equal to. Again, negative times negative is positive. Positive 1. What we have to realize next, what we have to ask ourselves next is, where is this going to be true in the, on the number line? So if we have a number line here, there is our 0, there is our positive 1, there is our negative 1. Oh, what the hell? What the hell is the matter with me? So here is our negative 1, here is our positive 1. Is it possible, is it possible for our x to be negative 2? Is it possible? Let's find out, shall we? If you put negative 2 here, negative 2 squared, negative 2 squared is 4, and 4 is not less than or equal to 1. 4 is not less than or equal to 1. I'm going to write it someplace out here. 0, negative 1, and a positive 1. That tells us that x cannot be negative 1, no, negative 2. x cannot be negative 2. x cannot be, be, x cannot be below negative 1. Is it possible for x to be positive 2? Of course, x cannot be positive 2, because positive 2 squared will be 4, and 4 is not less than 1. Is it possible, is it possible for x to be negative 1 and a half? Let's find out. Negative 1 and a half squared is 1.5, if you like, very quickly, if you want to do it, 1.5 times 1.5. But don't look at it like that. Don't look at it as 1.5 times 1.5. Keep your life simple, and look at it as 15 times 15. And I hope you know your squared. And therefore you would know, I hope that you know your squares, and therefore you would know that 15 squared is simply 225. 
225 and therefore since we have a decimal here since we have a decimal here 1.5 times 1.5 we have to move this decimal two places one two it ends up here it's two and a quarter it's two and a quarter 1.5 times 1.5 is two and a quarter and two and a quarter this is equal to two and a quarter and two and a quarter is not less than or equal to one two and a quarter is not less than one as you can see it doesn't work so if x happens to be negative one negative one and a half it would not work if x happens to be positive one and a half it would not work what we find is that the only place where x squared is going to be less than or equal to one x squared is going to be less than or equal to one is if x happens to fall in this area anything between anything between negative one and positive one but including the end point but including the end point because of the equal sign because of the equal sign had there not been an equal sign we would have put a we would have put an open circle without without this equal sign here without this equal sign we would have had a open circles on both ends here but since we have since we have equal sign the circles have to be closed and the answer is that any value that falls between negative one and positive one will do the job nicely and that's all it is i'll see you tomorrow okay bye now